preparing for today's talk was a bit of a challenge because we now have a worldwide audience and many viewers probably have never heard of the electric sun model or the sapphire experiment. The sapphire experiment is charged with the task of exploring the theory that our sun, all stars, are electrically powered. And to do this, we have a chamber with a little ball in the middle. This is our little sun. Then we fill the chamber with various gases, apply various voltages, and create an electric plasma discharge. We then must design experiments and collect data. And that data will be compared with the wealth of NASA, European Space Agency, other agency data. And ideally, SAFIRE experiments will replicate the type of measurements done of our sun so that we can have an apples-to-apples -apples discussion with our scientific cousins in these organizations. And if I do my job well, we will also be able to suggest new ways of looking at the existing satellite data that will highlight electrical aspects of the sun. Designing experiments to prove scientific theories is difficult. There is no instruction manual for how to do it. I recall vividly my teachers, who studied with the generation of Schrodinger and Dirac, trying to impress upon us young physicists that the data you collect in any experiment can be interpreted in many ways. And if one wishes to create a new scientific model, as they had helped to create quantum mechanics, then you need to think big. And they were clear to tell us, the struggles you will end up facing will not only be scientific, you will also find yourself fighting political battles, and sometimes even religious battles. To look at the difficulty of verifying new scientific models, we can look at another instance in history where there were disagreements about the fundamental electrical nature of our universe. A short story about the vision of one scientist and the data he collected. In the late 1800s, Christian Birkeland had an intuition that the Earth and the Sun were electrically connected. Now, this was not the prevailing idea at the time. The prevailing idea was that the Earth and the Sun were electrically isolated from each other. So we have two theories. On the one hand, the Earth and Sun electrically connected. On the other, the Earth and the Sun electrically isolated. So how would you prove which theory is correct? Birkeland made many excursions into the Arctic regions of Norway, and with hand-held magnets, he measured magnetic fields on the ground while the northern lights blazed overhead. So on the left of this figure, we have Birkeland's theory that the sun and the earth are electrically connected. In the middle, a little schematic of a model showing electrical connection between the sun and the earth. And down at the bottom there, you can see uh, Birkeland walking around the Arctic with his handheld magnets. Now, the data he collected on the ground actually matched his model, and he took that as support of his theory. Now, on the right-hand side of this drawing, you can see the prevailing idea at the time, no electrical connection between the Earth and the Sun. And a well-known mathematician of the time created an elegant theory to show that all you needed was heat from the Sun, and that would generate local convection currents above the Earth's poles, and this then would generate the same exact compass measurements on the ground. And that second theory is the one that won out. Now, the passage of 100 years has somewhat blunted this story for you and me, and we don't know anybody personally connected with it. Just an anecdote on the history of science. But it bothers me, and I often think, well, could those measurements taken beneath the blazing northern lights, could they really not tell us which theory was correct? And the answer is no, they could not. As all too often happens, the data works equally well in both models. And one theory prevails, usually more for social or philosophical reasons than scientific reasons. And Birkeland never got to see his ideas accepted. The isolationists won out until about the 1970s, when satellite measurements were good enough to actually show that there are indeed electrical connections between the Earth and the Sun. You saw this earlier. This is one of the beautiful discharges from our chamber. We call this one the flower discharge. Uh, and it's actually not spherical, it's more disc-shaped. 
uh, and it's not clear what the conditions are that produce this. <clears throat> so we're now at a time where there is the real possibility for a paradigm change in astronomy. Enough data has been collected that probably future astronomers will grow up studying such concepts as electrical double layers, electric potential over large distances of space, and cosmic Birkeland currents. The study of the sun is a particularly fruitful area for studying electricity in space. Here is a short list of observations collected over many years by many different people in the EU community. You don't have to read them all, just to give you an idea that uh, there's quite a bit. And with each, within each one of these, there are actually thousands of papers and conference proceedings. Uh, so the good news is there's a lot of material for us to choose from. Now for the point of view of where we're at currently with Sapphire, here's a short list that I will be talking about of specific areas to focus on. So I'll talk about each one of these in course. Okay, this is one of the, a lot of us have seen this, one of the very confusing diagrams about the sun, a plot of the sun's temperature as a function of height above the sun's surface. So a zero height on the uh, left-hand side there, the photosphere, about 5,000 degrees. And as we move away from the sun, the temperature increases in a uh, very, specific jumps as you move away. Uh, and then uh, at a certain point, uh, the temperature shoots way up very quickly through the transition zone up to millions of degrees. Now, if, this, if the Sapphire experiment sees something like this in our chamber, that's a major win for the electrical model of the sun. And just to be clear, no one has yet flown a thermometer into the sun Okay? When you see statements about the sun's temperature like these, those statements are made by looking at light emitted from the sun. Now, some of the light emitted from the sun is in discrete spectral lines, and scientists can use spectral lines to measure temperature. For example, we might be measuring just one line from one element on the sun, say neon. We're measuring one color of neon light from the sun. And we can examine the details of how that line changes as you move away from the sun. So here's a short diagram uh, to say what I mean here. Um, you can imagine three different cases. Uh, in the top diagram, this one here, the width of the line, the size of your spectral line, is broadest close to the sun, and then it gets more narrow as you move away from the sun, and you, if, you do, if you're using line width to be a proxy or an estimation of temperature, you would say, well, things are cooling down as I move away from the sun. Okay, it's, sometimes that's called the campfire model, that things get colder as you move away from the campfire. Now, we can imagine a different case, this middle one here, where the width of the line stays the same as you move away from the sun. Now, if we saw that, then we would say, well, by using line width as a measure of temperature, it stays the same as you move away from the sun. Okay, and then the last example, one down here, which is more like our real sun, the line widths increase as you move away, and so again, using this as a proxy for temperature, you say things must be getting hotter as we move away. So using this as just one principle, just one of the many principles we have at our disposal, we can look at uh, some movie of, uh, of some actual the sapphire spectra, which you saw earlier, but I like watching it. Yeah, okay. Real time, this is what it looks like. That's when all the USB ports blew up on the computers. <laughs> uh, now there is a wealth of information, as you could imagine, in, the, in this spectral data. Uh, 
we can just choose one, one slice, one snapshot from that, and we can just choose one of the lines in one of the snapshots, and we can uh, look at that line um, from different points in the chamber. Uh, so here's a picture of, uh, of the chamber, and you can see the center glow is the, is the anode, right? This part here, the center glow is the anode. And then down here, do you see these um, cylinders? Those are our fiber optics. That's what's collecting the light, uh, collecting the light in the chamber. And you can see how they point in different directions. So one, you know, one, we can point in where we want. One will just graze the anode. One will look at halfway out. Maybe one looks towards the cathode. So this is a way that we were exploring that how can we measure uh, line widths and other properties at different points in the chamber. It actually was not obvious when we started out uh, if it was even possible. Uh, so we can look at, again, at just one, one line, one spectral line. Uh, here's a plot that shows just looking at, um, actually this is more than one line, several different lines uh, and looking at, at their widths. So all the ones over here, these are all red, maybe these are blue, these are the blues. Are, these are blue spectral lines in our discharge. And over here, the reds, so this is like a rainbow. Over here are red spectral lines in our, in our discharge. And you can see that uh, here's like, for example, you know, one, two, three, four, five different points up here. They have more width to them. So the vertical axis on this graph is how wide the line is. So this group here has more width to their lines than this group down here. Uh, so that was great. So we verified, yes, we can show that we can distinguish different line widths in different parts. And then I went back and I said, oh, well, wait a minute, which, which, which groups are these? And this whole group up here was all from fiber optics looking at the anode or close to the anode. Sorry, backwards. <laughs> this group down here was all looking at the anode, close to the anode. This group here was all looking away. So again, if we use this as a proxy for temperature, which I'll say more later, there's other ways to look at it, uh, then we've got already here some kind of strange result where it looks like, even in our chamber, uh, temperature might be, might be higher as you move away from the center. Now here is uh, looking at one particular uh, point. Um, it's not only, there's, an, there's another way that this, we, we analyze the data, which is the shape of a line. Not only how wide it is, but the shape of it. And that actually tells us a fair amount about the physics. So for example, if your line width, your, your line shape is fit by Gaussian statistics, then you're probably looking more at temperature an indication of temperature. If your shape is fit more by a different kind of statistics, Lorentzian statistics, then you're probably looking more at electron density in the chamber. Uh, and so again, our, our job was to say, well, can we measure these differences? And yes, we can measure these differences within our chamber. All right, moving on to the next item in the short list, coronal streamers. Here's going to be a, a movie of uh, SOHO, ultraviolet data. So the sun is in the center there. These are coronal, called coronal streamers flying off. Now, people at the Catania Observatory in uh, Italy, uh, uh, Ventura and Spadaro, they looked at these coronal streamers and they wanted to examine things like temperature. Uh, how does the temperature vary inside of these streamers? Okay, so that white line there shows you like an example of where they were sampling data. And they found some pretty strange <laughs> results. Here's, here's some of their data. They were using line width, the width of these spectral lines, as a measure of temperature. And what they found, completely unexpected, was that um, it depends upon what element you're looking at. And so all of these upper plot points here, these are all from oxygen atoms inside the streamer, and as you move away from the sun, those oxygen atoms get hotter and hotter and hotter, okay? These down here are all using the same method, looking at line width as a measure of temperature, but for hydrogen, 
hydrogen is a hundred times colder. This is a logarithmic plot, a hundred times colder, and it gets cooler as you move away from the sun. So needless to say, these were unexpected uh, results, and it's not at all ex uh, clear what this, why this would come about. Um, it also makes me wonder if we really can make such simple correlations between line width and temperature. Because one person would say, well, clearly, your oxygen is hotter than your hydrogen. Someone else I'd say, well, you know what? Maybe we don't really understand the connection between line width and temperature. I would be one of those people. So now we're going to look at... Uh, Oh, right, it gets even better. Sorry, I almost forgot. It gets even better. So now they're going to look at the temperature profile as you cut across a single streamer. Okay, so that line there shows um, a slice perpendicular to the streamer. We're going to look at the data across that, look at the, the oxygen and the hydrogens again. Uh, so here's a plot of the intensity as you cut across the streamer. Now, that makes sense. Uh, it's the, there's more intensity coming out of the streamer in the middle, right? It's, quiet, then it gets intense, then it's quiet again. Fine. Now let's look at what happens if we look at the temperature of oxygen as we cut across. Well, it is hotter outside the streamer, then it cools down in the streamer, and then it gets hot again. All right. Look at hydrogen, just the opposite. It's cooler outside the streamer, the temperature goes up as you get inside the streamer, and then it's cold again as you go on the other side. So these were extremely strange results. Uh, now, I think this is a, could be as an, uh, a consequence of electrical activity on the sun, but again, we have to design experiments that can verify this. This is one particularly beautiful discharge. So whether or not these discharge structures that we see, whether or not they correspond directly to photosphere granules, whether they correspond directly to coronal streamers, okay, all this is yet to be uh, established. Um, but the approach, again, to emphasize, the approach of Sapphire is that we need to mimic the types of measurements that are done of the sun, okay? So we would use our fiber optics to look inside of these structures here, the same way that the people in Catania used the SDO data, and we'll see if we have uh, measurements that correspond. Now, we have the added benefit of having additional instruments, like, for example, a Langmuir probe, which can measure the plasma characteristics, uh, voltage, potential, uh, ion, electron temperatures. So we can take that data then and then suggest back to other people new ways they can look at the existing satellite data. So now, given all this, this is how, then I, this, then I go to Monty and I say, Monty, we need to be able to move the fiber optics across the anode tufts. The anode tufts are about uh, two millimeters across. I need a positional uh, fiber optic that's down to about 0.05 millimeters. Can you do that for me? And as you heard earlier today, he comes back eventually and goes, yeah, I can do that for you. I can do that, right? And I ask Lowell, I say, Lowell, I think, can you look at the Boltzmann equation for our situation? Uh, see what you think that the temperature, the measured temperature of oxygen and hydrogen would be. Uh, sh do you think we would see the same sorts of things that we see around the sun? Okay, on to the next item in the list. That was the first ionization potential anomaly. Okay, the first ionization potential anomaly is a well-known but unexplained observation of our sun and other stars. And an analogy will help a lot here. So imagine that you are throwing a very big party, okay? Hundreds of guests. They're from all walks of life, some rich, some poor, some men, some women, married, not married. And imagine that you notice a pattern. You notice that there's always the same set of 12 people that go outside and talk outside for a while. And amongst those 12, it's a mix. Some are young, some are old, some are married or not, and they're not smoking. So what would they have in common? Why do they go outside? So when you were thinking that over, now we can switch to the astronomical case. Something happens very similar to this party example to the chemical elements on the sun. And a certain group of elements are much more likely to be found outside the sun than on the surface of the sun. 
So for example, on the photosphere, we see about 35 magnesium atoms for every million hydrogen atoms. But in the solar wind leaving the sun, there are four times that many magnesium atoms. Another example, we see about 47 iron atoms for every million hydrogen atoms on the photosphere. But a solar flare might have a hundred times that much iron. And for helium, it's exactly the opposite. There are fewer helium atoms in energetic particle emissions from the sun than there are in the photosphere. So what makes these special? Why do some of them tend to be found outside the sun? Why do some of the guests tend to go outside the party? So it seems that it all comes down to how easy it is to pull an electron off of that element. Now, if it's easy to pull an electron off of an element, then we find more of that element outside the sun, like in solar flares or the solar wind. And physicists have a name for how easy it is to pull an electron off an atom. It's called the first ionization potential. So here's a plot of various chemical elements. Uh, the horizontal axis, have I got? Yeah. The horizontal axis here is how easy it is to pull off an electron. You can see over here on the left, it's about four volts is what you need to pull off the first electron off of potassium. Then there's a progression, and when you get out to here, like neon and helium, it's really hard to pull off an electron off of those elements. And the vertical axis here shows how much more likely it is to find that element outside the photosphere. So you can see the elements on the left, the ones where it's easy to pull an electron off, those are the ones that you find more abundant in emissions from the sun. And elements on the right with the higher ionization potential are less likely to be found outside the sun. So going back to our analogy, we found a property that tells us why, might tell us why these 12 people keep going outside the party. Now, why this one property of first ionization potential should lead to all of this is not at all clear from the standard model of the sun, where you only get to use hot gases and magnetic fields. It is explainable from the electric sun model, but the main point is we need to design an experiment that will measure it. So like NASA, we would use spectroscopy to remotely deduce the abundances of different elements close to our anode, and like NASA, we would use a mass spectrometer away from the anode to measure the elements far from the anode. So now I have more requests for Monty. Monty, can we coat the anode in magnesium? Magnesium has a low ionization potential. And then Paul, if I give you fiber optic data and mass spec data, what other factors do you need that'll give us good statistics on the DOE? So I hope you can start to see the flexibility of the sapphire chamber, that we can ask such a wide variety of questions and actually stand a good chance of running experiments to look at them in the laboratory. Next on the list. So sometimes it's important to step back uh, and look at the forest, not the trees. And as many have heard here, one of the outstanding features of the sun is its discrete layers and they're very, very different properties. So here's a combination on the, on the uh, right there, the photosphere. Um, we see a lot of that. Then just, just a hair's breadth, hair's breadth above the photosphere is the chromosphere, uh, which if you look at it closely, looks a lot like a fur coat with clouds floating over it. Very strange. Um, and then you move out a little bit more, the lower corona, that's where you see all this incredible loops and x-ray emissions, uh, a lot of dynamic activity. Pulling back further, you see the upper uh, corona, which again has very different properties, these wispy, hairy filaments that extend out for long, long distances. Then there seems to be a long stretch where things don't change that much in the solar atmosphere until you get to the heliosphere boundary. And right now the Voyager satellites, as we know, are out there going through some boundary of some kind. Uh, what it is has now been thrown up into question. Um, this is an artist's rendering uh, of the uh, uh, Voyager satellites out at the boundary of the solar system. 
Now, these probes are returning very interesting data. On the left, it shows a plot of Voyager measuring the electron density as it's passing through the boundary. On the right is a plot of uh, the density of positive ions as it's going through this boundary. And the main point is these rapid fluctuations that we see at the boundary. Uh, are these rapid fluctuations due to um, bow shocks and uh, supersonic flows? Or we all know that these uh, rapid fluctuations are actually a quite natural consequence of electrical double layers. So the Voyager data is taking place far out from the sun, right? So that's not us measuring close to our anode, that's measuring us far away from the anode in our chamber. So again, I get to ask Monty, I need a Langmuir probe. It also has to have sub-millimeter resolution because I need to see the fluctuations in our chamber and compare them to the data we're getting back from Voyager and see if we see something similar. Next item. It was coronal, I call it the coronal jolt. Uh, so CMEs, coronal mass ejections, are uh, spectacular emissions off the surface of the sun. They're sometimes associated with a solar flare. A solar flare is an eruption that's very localized on the sun, very small spatial location solar flare. And one of the main unanswered questions about CMEs is still, are they large-scale events or are they small-scale events? Okay, now the small-scale camp says CMEs start from a solar flare. They start from a very small part on the sun, which then blasts out and fills space around the sun and goes away. And that's how you get your CME. And they have some data that supports that model. There was another camp that says, no, CMEs are actually a large-scale event, that the eruption that we see is taking place over such a large area, there is no way that a single point on the sun can lead to all that. And this camp also has data to support their theory. Okay, so now we're going to look at... Uh, so this is the sun uh, in UV, extreme UV. Uh, and I want you to look at the lower right side of it. Pulse, pulse, pulse. Can you see how that, the outer atmosphere, can I draw on this? The outer, we're looking here primarily, It'll, you'll see it here, the outer atmosphere of the sun. And I want you to look for, yeah, pulse down, pulse down. So it, that may look uh, like not much <laughs> is going on, but that is billions of cubic miles of plasma that is behaving all as a single unit over about 40 minutes. So that's actually a very big uh, unified action from the sun. The, the, the coronal mass ejection is taking place on the far side of the sun here. So we don't see the coronal mass ejection. We only see from the back side, we see the whole uh, atmosphere of the sun uh, pulsing like that. Okay, so do we see something like this in Sapphire? And yes, we do. And you've probably you've seen this a couple times uh, over this uh, weekend. Um, this is our anode, and then periodically there's a buildup of energy close to the anode. Then it will release explosively, and then the anode is notably dimmer afterwards. Okay, here's a little video which you saw already, but it doesn't hurt to see it again. Oh. Build up, release, and then dimmer. So once again, the commissioning phase of Sapphire exceeded our expectations. Not only can we resolve high-speed plasma discharges from the anode, but we already have data indicating a direct correlation with existing NASA data. And lastly, comets. Uh, as many people in the EU community have said, uh, there are many aspects about comets that only make sense if 
the electric sun model is true. So here's a couple of photos of 67P. Uh, so in conjunction with Franklin and Ariba, the Sapphire group were working on some very specific experiments to examine the electric comet hypothesis. Uh, you saw this a little while ago. This is one of the ways we're going to examine it is to uh, place uh, different materials, possible materials, on the end of our probe and then send those materials in various orbits around the anode. So that blue line is tracing out the orbit. Just an example, sample orbit that we could send something on inside the chamber. Uh, this is one of the materials we're going to start with. More, this is again from Franklin's suggestions of type of material to start with. Uh, and so, for example, one set of experiments we could run, you can see on the uh, left there, I have a column for, well, what's the cometary feature that we are mimicking? And in this case, it's certain materials that we know are on comets. Of course, there's a lot of disagreement about how much of the material is on comets, whether comets are ice or whether comets are primarily rocky. But on the left column there, you see various rocky elements that we'll start with. And in the middle, it's kind of, well, what, what's, this, what's the sapphire uh, example of that? Well, it's, it's uh, a piece of rock, like you can see there in the photograph. And then what, will, what kind of measurements will we make that will mimic existing measurements of outer space? And so, for example, and there's a lot of detail this, if you saw Franklin's uh, talk, we, he would predict to see the, uh, certain um, gases, certain organic compounds coming out of this. Uh, and in particular, you know, if we see a increased concentration of water in our chamber as we're zipping this rock around, then we know it's from electrochemistry and not from a dirty snowball. So that would be an example of how we could mimic existing data with a different model. Um, dustification, I think he made up that word. Dustification uh, of the comet nucleus is also something we can look at. Here's a, another picture of 67P. Uh, so the fact that 67P was rocky is not a surprise to EU theorists, but the presence of dust, large amounts of dust, not so obvious. So if 67P was blasted off of Mars, yes, there would be a lot of dust created, right? But it's so small, the comet, would it really attract all of that dust back to itself? You know, I don't think so. Uh, so how would we explain something like this where not only do we have um, a lot of dust, there's these lanes of dust throughout the comet, but if you blow that up, it actually looks like there's been a dust landslide, okay? So this begs the question, maybe dust is being continuously created on the comet. Okay, so this is another thing we can do. We can, over the course of time, look for uh, the type of dust, if any, that's created. Franklin and Ariba thinks that the electric discharge will break down the larger silicate structures into smaller silicate dust, but this remains to be seen through an experiment. And hopefully, the folks at ESA will publish some data about 67P's dust composition. Another example of how we can look at our situation to examine comets, we're going to look at all the properties around our little comet, the electron density, the temperature, uh, the elemental analysis. And so what you see here, this uh, sketch on the, uh, on the right here, this is an analysis of the comet Hale-Bopp. Uh, uh, there was the Swan telescope in 1979, I think, 97, um, returned some UV images of Hale-Bopp. And then if you use a, a, a certain reasonable assumptions about the nature of the coma around the comet, uh, and you compare uh, observed UV emissions to your model, you get this, these interesting set of plots for the uh, temperature as you move away from the comet. So here, the te according to this model, the, the temperature should drop as you move away from Hale-Bopp and then go up and then drop and go up, et cetera. Now, this is very reminiscent already of measurements that we are collecting inside the sapphire chamber. Electrical double layers have a lot of these kind of oscillatory uh, qualities to them, where something is uh, like electron density will go up and down, up and down as you move away. And, of course, 
the filaments. Uh, here's a wonderful gallery, I love this, of its different filaments around 67P. And I, I, I realized as I was wait, uh, listening to my introduction that we should, we should carve our little rocks into the same shapes as various comets and then see if we can replicate simply the morphology of the discharge around the comets. All right, so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for sticking with me. A couple of very meaty ideas in it out there. Um, but it gives you a taste, I think, of the sapphire uh, chamber and how versatile it is. Uh, the number of different questions we can ask and actually uh, take actual measurements to verify. So thank you very much. I want to explicitly thank the people who are making this experiment possible.